Uh, hello, this is our lecture number 12, and we're going to be talking about uh, some actual real life examples uh, of classical conditioning that I think will help you to understand uh, this type of learning uh, a little bit better. I mean, you know the principles now of classical conditioning. We took a look at that in our previous lecture. Uh, so let's uh, begin now to explore uh, some common everyday uh, examples. First example that I want to talk about is one that really comes from my own uh, experiences. Uh, you know, when uh, uh, in the home that I live in, the house that I live in, uh, that I've been in for quite some time, uh, my wife and I uh, have a master bedroom that has uh, a bathroom uh, in it. And uh, when our two boys were uh, uh, growing up and living with us, uh, we also had um, uh, upstairs um, uh, in our uh, uh, in our house uh, uh, another bathroom uh, that they would use and those two bathrooms really were um, adjacent to one another that is they shared a, a wall um, and um, um, oftentimes uh, um, you know you could hear what was going on maybe a little bit about what was going on in the adjacent bathroom. If there was a shower running, for example, or a toilet, for example, had been flushed. Um, and um, this happened to me one day. I, I got up uh, in the morning and uh, went into the bathroom in our master bedroom and I uh, climbed into the shower and I adjusted the the uh, shower, uh, the, the cold water and the hot water just right so that uh, the, uh, uh, the temperature of the water was uh, just what I wanted. And uh, uh, then, um, uh, you know, as I was taking my uh, shower, I could hear in the adjacent uh, bathroom that the, the toilet had been flushed. And um, so one of my sons was in, in the bathroom and, um, you know, I'd gone to the bathroom and flushed the toilet and all of a sudden the, the water in, in my uh, shower got incredibly hot, uh, so hot that uh, I almost got burned. I had to back away from it. And uh, as many of you know, in a, in a typical home, the uh, uh, toilets use uh, uh, cold water. Uh, so when you flush uh, a toilet, the cold water is going uh, into that part of your uh, uh, system and it's uh, taking away from other parts of your, of your uh, plumbing system. So um, on each uh, future occasion uh, in which I was uh, taking a shower and I could hear uh, that uh, toilet being flushed uh, in the adjacent bathroom, I would, I would back away quickly uh, from my shower uh, or even turn the shower off uh, because I knew that what would happen soon would be this uh, incredibly uh, uh, hot water um, that, would, that would burn me. Uh, so this is an example, very simple example of classical conditioning. You know, the flushing toilet takes away the cold water from the shower. And again, you have this very, very hot water that becomes the unconditioned stimulus. Uh, the unconditioned response is backing away or jumping away from that hot water. So the sound of that flushing toilet then becomes a conditioned stimulus. And, you know, it's producing that avoidance response of stepping away uh, from the, uh, uh, before the hot water arrives and, and potentially, you know, burns you, scalds you. So that's a very simple example. Um, let me give you another example. Um, one of the things that you may know is that in the winter time, uh, there's reduced moisture uh, in the air and um, the probability that you could produce static uh, electricity is, is quite high simply by walking across the floor. And if you touch a electrical socket, um, what can happen is that you'll get a little bit of a shock. Um, and a uh, very interesting occurrence, uh, when I was a young boy, I can remember <clears throat> in our living room that the, uh, uh, we had uh, a cat and the cat would like to sleep right next to the, the fireplace. 
Um, and I can remember it was in the winter time. I walked across the floor. There was a rug on the floor, and I went uh, to touch the the cat uh, on its head, you know, close to its nose, and it produced. Um, it, it looked like a spark, um, and um, it, it was in fact the static electricity. And the the cat just jumped up and it ran away. Uh, and on future occasions, when I would approach the cat um, and put my hand out, the cat would run away from me. Uh, so again, my hand now had become uh, a conditioned stimulus. The sight of my hand coming towards the, the cat had become a conditioned stimulus. So again, just another simple example. Um, having cats in our, our house uh, also uh, produced another opportunity, really, to understand uh, classical conditioning. Opening a can of cat food, one thing that happens is uh, uh, that uh, uh, the, the sound, uh, as well as the smell, uh, travels, and it travels very quickly. And I can remember that our cat would sometimes be several uh, rooms away, but uh, when it uh, heard uh, that uh, a can being opened, uh, and uh, then soon after could could smell uh, the food, the dog, the uh, cat would uh, come into the kitchen area and start rubbing up, up and down against my parents' legs because it knew that it was going to be getting this food soon. So again, another um, uh, simple example of classical conditioning. Um, classical conditioning, uh, you know, consider this, you know, the experiments of Ivan Pavlov, uh, how might those experiments actually help an actor? Well, there's one individual, uh, his name was Konstantin Stanislavski, here he is right here, uh, developed a whole system of acting called method acting. He recognized that the recall of memories of maybe sad experiences, emotional experiences uh, that could provoke a crime, uh, that it's the recall of those memories that could produce like uh, on-demand crime. Uh, staged tears, if you will. Uh, and again, how are they produced? They're produced by stimulus that's associated with sadness, that, that memory, uh, the recall of that sad experience. He called these affective memories. And indeed, this method acting is uh, uh, something that he was well known for. And, uh, you know, these on demand tears, for example, uh, that you see, um, you know, if you watch a soap opera on television, and it's, it's a very sad um, um, occasion, a sad scene in which uh, uh, an individual um, uh, is crying. That's, that's how it's produced. And it's produced by recalling those memories of a very sad experience emotional experience, uh, maybe early in your lifetime. Uh, and, and again, these are, this is something, a tool, okay, that is used uh, in order to produce crying. It's based simply upon classical. Let me talk a little bit about a really important experiment that was done some years ago by two researchers, John Garcia and Robert Kelling, two psychologists. Uh, who performed an experiment on a phenomenon that we now refer to as conditioned taste aversion. And it's really very simple, uh, but the applications of this that you will see as we go along become uh, very important. Um, this is research that was done with animals. It was done with rats. Rats have a sweet tooth, uh, just like human beings. Uh, for example, they love, absolutely love sweetened water. Uh, so what Garcia and Kelling did was this. Um, they took an animal and placed it in this situation where it could drink from this bottle of water that you see right here that was uh, laced with saccharin. Uh, so it was sweet. And indeed, the, the rat um, had an opportunity uh, probably for about a two-hour period of time to drink from this sweet water. And indeed, uh, sweet, this, this bottle was sweetened water. And indeed, that's exactly what they did. Um, after that two hour period of time, what Garcia and Kelly did was this. Um, they um, uh, produced, uh, they, they exposed the rat to x-ray radiation, just enough to make the rat sick, maybe sick for 
an hour or two kind of that nauseous uh, kind of a feeling um, and it was not something that was long lasting but indeed um, uh, again the the animal had been drinking that sweetened water and then soon after it was exposed to the sweetened water it was made ill it was made sick just temporarily uh, the next day what Garcia and Kelly did was this they placed the animal into uh, this uh, same situation uh, where there was sweetened water but now there was a, a bottle of uh, regular tap water uh, and they looked to see how much uh, water the animal would drink uh, from the two bottles uh, and indeed what happened was the the rat um, uh, now uh, because it associated the sweetened water with the illness uh, rarely if ever drank from uh, this bottle and ordinarily it really loves uh, sweet things they avoided it and instead would drink from the regular tap uh, the bottle with tap water you know this is conditioned taste aversion learning and again it's based upon very simple classical conditioning uh, principles so you know the sweetened water uh, becomes the conditioned stimulus that conditioned stimulus has been associated with the illness that is produced uh, the nausea that is produced by the x-ray radiation and again you get this avoidance response where the animal now avoids the sweet water so again this is a conditioned taste um, aversion and you will see elements of this in some of the other uh, experiments uh, that I wanted to you so now let me talk about another interesting experience that I had as a young boy. I think I was about 10 years of age and uh, my uh, father uh, wanted to take me uh, out to the Midwest where uh, he grew up. We were living in uh, Massachusetts at the time. Uh, and uh, this was my first airline flight and I couldn't wait to go on it and we arrived at Logan Airport I can remember it was in the middle of July when we were making this trip and I was very excited about taking this flight and we got on board and um, uh, um, I was just you know all eyes really about observing everything that was going on around me and what happened was um, you know my father um, you know knew that I loved uh, gum in particular Wrigley Spearmint gum and um, he had some with him and he gave me uh, some of this just as uh, the flight was uh, getting ready to take off so I, I was really very happy I, was, I had a window seat I was looking out the window and you know chewing my gum and it was a great flight it was going from Boston to St. Paul Minnesota and um, uh, what happened uh, was that uh, over the course of the flight got very bumpy uh, and so so bumpy that um, uh, I became ill and uh, I, uh, I actually threw up uh, I remember and uh, uh, all over my my seat really probably some of my father as well um and uh you know i i'd gotten quite sick and from that point onward i didn't really want to have wrigley spearmint gum ever and even to this day um, if i chew gum i make sure that it's not spearmint gum i don't like anything now with spearmint so uh, our condition stimulus and our unconditioned stimulus um, you know the condition stimulus is the taste uh, and the smell of the gum the unconditioned stimulus is the nausea that's produced uh, the unconditioned response is the vomiting the disgust the avoidance that occurs so in the future now that taste and the smell of the gum uh, is associated with the vomiting and disgust and the avoidance so uh, again, this is, uh, you know, an example, a very simple example of classical conditioning, and in particular of conditioned taste aversion, like what we saw in the case of Garcia and Kelly's uh, very important work from a number of years ago. Here's another interesting example of taste aversion. You know, in certain parts of the country, namely in our uh, southwest, um, uh, sheep ranching is a very uh, profitable business uh, and one thing that happened a number of years ago was that they were having problems with coyotes that would come down uh, uh, in the uh, evening 
uh, come down from um, uh, higher elevations and they would begin to uh, kill the sheep uh, and eat them. Uh, and they had um, uh, tried a number of ways of, of trying to control this, none of, none of which were really effective. But here's one thing uh, that they uh, arrived at. They made uh, what they called lamb burgers. Okay, they took some lamb uh, meat uh, and they infused it with a uh, poison um, uh, that would produce illness uh, if it was consumed. Uh, and then what they did was they would wrap these uh, lamb burgers that have been infused with this poison uh, uh, in uh, lamb's uh, wool. Uh, and they would place these all around the perimeter of this uh, sheep farm. So now when the uh, coyotes uh, at night uh, would start to invade uh, the area, uh, they would uh, smell these lamb burgers uh, and they would go over and they would eat them and then they would become ill. And uh, they would uh, again be sick for a period of time and they would associate the smell uh, as well as the taste. Uh, of those lamb burgers um, and uh, in the future uh, they would not attack and kill um, any of the sheep because of this condition taste aversion. So again the sight and smell of the lamb it's associated with the nausea from eating of that toxic lamb burger uh, and you get the vomiting and the disgust that occurs uh, as a consequence of that and then in the future just the sight and smell of the lamb uh, that's enough uh, to produce the vomiting and, and disgust. So this was a way then of, of, of saving their sheep. Uh, and again, their, their, uh, their profit uh, from this uh, was not being destroyed by these um, coyotes that would uh, come down and invade um, at night. So again, another very important um, aspect of uh, classical conditions. Um, consider this. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that happened uh, a number of years ago when patients were being treated, uh, cancer patients were being treated with various types of chemotherapy. Uh, chemotherapy by its nature, uh, because it's killing cells uh, within um, uh, physiological systems, uh, it can make you um, ill. Um, and one of the things that would happen is that individuals who are having this uh, chemotherapy uh, would routinely um, uh, experience this illness. And if they ate uh, anything uh, shortly before they were exposed to the chemotherapy, even uh, things that they really liked a lot, food that they really liked, they would tend to avoid it in the future because it had been associated with the illness that had been produced by the chemotherapy. Um, you know, you have to try to avoid that. And, and again, one of the things now that uh, routinely is done with cancer patients that are receiving chemotherapy is they're told not to, not to eat at least for several hours before uh, they come in and, and have their chemotherapy treatment. Consider this very interesting experiment that was done a number of years ago with young children, for example, where um, uh, these young children were given uh, some of this ice cream, uh, you know, maple flavored, it's called maple toff ice cream, uh, shortly before they received uh, uh, chemotherapy treatment. Uh, so some would receive the uh, uh, have the ice cream shortly before the chemotherapy. And some would just have the, the ice cream alone, and uh, some would have you know no no ice cream uh, at all. Uh, and if you take a look at what would happen later on, um, you know several days later, in terms of the preferences that these kids would have for different types of ice cream. Those that had had the chemotherapy and had had some of that maple toff ice cream shortly before it avoided. Uh, here you can see a lot fewer of these kids would uh, choose to have the maple toff ice cream as opposed to some other flavor. And again, these are our control groups here. So this is a pretty substantial difference that you see here. Uh, so a very significant effect. So again, this is classical conditioning, you know, conditioned taste aversion uh, that's, that's operating. So again, one of the outcomes of all this is that uh, this, this is something that's now very strictly controlled, that it's uh, in most cases you, you're not to eat anything for about six to eight hours before 
uh, you actually have your chemotherapy treatment because of the risk of these condition taste aversions developing. Let's now talk about probably the single most important experiment that was done in this area. Uh, and again, uh, that we're talking about some of the applications of uh, this classical conditioning um, uh, uh, concept learning uh, developed by Ivan Pavlov. And what I want to talk to you now is about what's called conditioned immunosuppression. And this is research that was done out at the University of Rochester Medical School by a psychologist by the name of Robert Ader. You see Robert Ader there in that picture. Uh, and here's, here's how this experiment was done. Um, uh, uh, rats uh, uh, were exposed uh, to uh, a bottle of um, uh, a water that contained saccharin in it. And they were allowed over a two, two hour period of time to, to drink as much of that saccharin as they wanted. Shortly after they drank the saccharin, they were injected with this uh, substance uh, called cyclophosphamide, which is uh, you know, a, a poison which will make you ill. Uh, and uh, what they found was that after doing this over a series of days, what, what they found was that these animals, these rats, uh, that had been exposed to the saccharin and then the cyclophosphamide, um, progressively uh, started to die. And this was a situation where, where they should not have been dying. Uh, nobody could understand why they were dying. Uh, yes, they were avoiding the saccharin uh, in a two-bottle test. They were now you know, switching their preference over to, to drinking uh, water instead. But uh, many of them died, and this was very perplexing to Ader. Um, if you take a look um, at um, this experiment that they did, take a look at this step one. You know, the drug itself, cyclophosphamide, uh, produces um, unconditioned responses, uh, one of which is illness, uh, but another one is, as it turns out, immunosuppression. So your immune system is being compromised, and now you're much more susceptible uh, to uh, uh, you know uh, various uh, disease states as as a consequence of it. So that neutral stimulus of the sweet tasting water, when you combine it with the drug, uh, now uh, every time uh, you present that uh, 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 sweet tasting water, it's producing suppression of your immune system. So what was happening then in this very interesting experiment was that there were two things that were being conditioned. One was aversion to the sweet water. The animals were, instead of uh, preferring the sweet water uh, by virtue of the association uh, now with the illness, uh, they instead were, were drinking the, the regular tap water. But at the same time, what was happening, in addition to this conditioned taste aversion, the aversion to the sweet water, suppression of the immune system was occurring. So what this indicates then is that a classical conditioning process can modify your own internal physiology. And consider the implications of this. You know, this really was the beginning of the new field, uh, a field that is called uh, um, uh, psychoimmunology. Uh, uh, in which uh, we take a look at how environmental events can absolutely become conditioned to your internal uh, physiological, biological processes. And it's an incredibly important finding. So um, now at this, um, this other interesting experiment, this last experiment that I want to talk about, um, uh, on what we would call condition elevation of the immune system. You know, if you can produce a compromised immune system through classical conditioning. Maybe you can also actually improve the immune system and consider these various immune disorders, uh, for example, that we have out there, like AIDS, for example. How might that be useful in terms of trying to help individuals uh, combat AIDS? Well, here's a very simple experiment that was done with the animals a few years back. One thing that we know about egg white lysozyme. Okay, these are you know just regular egg whites. When they are injected into a living biological system, they increase 
antibody production from your immune system. So here's what one scientist did. Uh, they exposed rats uh, to uh, saccharin for a two hour period of time, uh, allowed them to drink as much as of, of it as they wanted to. And then shortly after that, they injected them with egg white lysosine. So again, what is happening then uh, in this particular preparation is that now in the future, the saccharin, right, increases antibody production. In other words, it improves your immune system. So this is a very, this is an incredibly important finding, which indicates once again, that you can classically condition a, 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 a compromised immune, to produce a compromised immune system. You can also classically condition it to improve uh, so, uh, again, a little bit of knowledge about classical conditioning is now helping us to understand uh, how uh, um, uh, this, this simple type of learning um, can be applied to so many different situations uh, and indeed um, can, can actually, you know, change, you know, our, our physiological status. Uh, that uh, conditioning alone in the absence of drugs or anything else can absolutely change our immune system. So again, this is a, an important finding. And again, through this lecture, I hope that I've given you some good examples, you know, of um, classical conditioning in everyday life, uh, as well as uh, how conditioning has, has absolutely uh, uh, classical conditioning is absolutely being used now for a number of beneficial uh, uh, purposes. Uh, again, helping to solve human problems. Uh, so in our next lecture, you know, we'll begin to talk about this other type uh, of learning uh, that we call uh, operant uh, or scenarian um, conditioning.